Welcome to the show, Bill. After that dramatic intro and that incredible bio kind of set you, set you up here, but um, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining. Um, everything going okay your way? Everything's fantastic. Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm, uh, I'm excited to chat with you today. Awesome. Yeah, super excited to have you. Everybody knows you in this industry. Seemingly, everybody knows you. You've, you've seemingly done a lot. You've taught a lot of people. You've added a lot of value to people's lives. And so what we like to talk about here on the show is like, what, what drives you? Like for some people, it's a double prong thing. Some of it is money. Some of it's financial success, but some of it might be a little deeper than that. Can you kind of give us a glimpse into maybe a little background on who you are and where you're from and how you, how you ended up where you are? Yeah, um, I guess I'll just start. I'm originally from Bakersfield, California, uh, the armpit of California, as Jay Leno <laughs> would say. Um, it's a great place to, to grow up in in the late '70s and in the '80s, and but it's a place I probably will never go back to. You know, to be <laughs> honest with you, um, I grew up with no father. Uh, my mom and, and dad got divorced when I was five. Uh, my mom was a school teacher. My whole family was in education. Uh, my grandmother was 1984 National Teacher of the Year out of oh, Aberdeen, wow. South Dakota. Uh, my grandfather was a professional athlete, basketball player, collegiate basketball coach, uh, still in education, went all the way back to finish his career as a principal at a middle school in Aberdeen, South Dakota, Farmer, third generation farmer. Um, and those kind of Midwestern core values from my grandfather, who was really my father figure growing up, um, you know, I, I think really instilled some some discipline in myself and self drive. And it's kind of ironic that I ended up, I excelled as an athlete growing up, Mark, I mean, it's kind of just in our genes, I guess, with my family, I was a, a good soccer player, a good basketball player, you know, all those things. But then um, probably the, the biggest fundamental thing that happened, I think there's there's a limited number of things that are presented to us in our life. And I think there's a handful of them. The question is, is do we grab onto them? Do we take advantage of them? And there are opportunities for us. And God put one in front of my mother and signed me up for the big brother program. Uh, Cause I didn't have a father and I was 12 years old and I can't remember his last name. I think it was Chris Ferguson. It was Chris and he was my big brother. And he took me to this driving range uh, at night to introduce me to golf. He was a, he just, he didn't play golf. He wasn't a golfer. He just thought it would be fun, something fun for him and I to yeah. connect with. And he introduced me to golf and it fundamentally changed the the, the course of my life. You know, I, I quickly started accelerating at golf. And what was really interesting is. How old were you at that point when you 12 years old, 12, you said yeah, that. he introduced me at 12. Um, I don't remember what part of the year it was. It was sometime during the school year. My mother, I lived in Bakersfield, California. My mother had just literally taken, a, like, I think it was a, a vice principal job or something in Shafter, California, which is just this small 18,000 person agricultural town. Um, so that summer, uh, because she wouldn't leave me at home all summer by myself, I think I was literally like in fifth grade, sitting a sit, going from sixth to seventh grade. She would drop me off at this golf course, just a public daily fee golf course. Uh, called North Kern in Bakersfield, California. And mm -hmm. at 7.15 in the morning, she'd go to school for summer school and she'd pick me up at four o'clock in the afternoon. And there was this group of guys, I can't remember their names, probably 50s, 60s, retired. You know, I'm talking like low end, like pull cart, shorts, golf shoes, guys wearing, you know, tats, no no shirts, drinking beer out there with me as a 12 or a 13 year old. Shorts. But, <laughs> but they taught me the game of golf. And which is different if anybody's played golf or, you know, other sports, it's different. I'm not going to say there's no integrity or anything around other sports because there is, but it's the things that you learn, the life lessons, how to control your temp, um, you know, your, your temperament, your anger, because you do get angry and the long period of around the golf that takes four hours and how to concentrate in short increments. I think that was really the fundamental thing that changed my life. I mean, I got really good at golf. Um, there, I, I played professional golf. I was finished third in the world championships as a junior golfer and, you know, had a lot of success, but I think what that did as an individual sport with no access to a coach, no access to a country club, any of those types of things to have to have that self-discipline, that drive that I learned from my mother. Cause Chris, once 
literally I had him as like a big brother for four or five months. He took me and introduced me. I just fell in love with it. We went like every day that I could get him to take me, but neither the problem was neither he or my mother could afford it. Um, and that's where I, you know, that summer was the life changing kind of, I almost feel like I went on this journey, you know, through the Sahara or something like that, kind of trying to learn this thing. And I got pretty decent that summer, Mark. And, and it was, it was the next about two years down the road. I'll fast forward into my high school season. The, the dichotomy happened with my mother who we weren't poor, but you know, I don't know. My mom probably made like 30 grand as a teacher in, in the mid eighties. And we had a house, um, you know, a three bedroom house. It was fine. Um, but she didn't have any extra, you know what I mean? So we weren't starving. I didn't miss a meal, but she didn't have any extra money. And I started getting really good, really fast. And I was winning tournaments and, Bakersfield. And then I started playing down in Southern California and LA and with guys like Phil Mickelson and Jason Gore and Tiger Woods and all these kids. And I was beating all of them except for one. We called him Eldrick at the time, but it was Tiger. <laughs> and I became really good. And then I was, hey, Bill got named to this Southern Cal America's Cup team and I got to travel. Well, we couldn't afford, you know, to travel. I can only afford to even drive down to LA three or four times a year to even be able to play. Mm -hmm. And so it became a dichotomy, and this is kind of something that's really personal for me now as a father, um, that my mother had to sacrifice everything for herself to give to me for me to be able to pursue that dream. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And kind of, I'm going to skip a lot of the stuff between that point and where I'm at today, but I think that's, I, I don't know 100%, but that's why I think I do what I do today. And this isn't my first rendition as a, a coach right? I've done it in other industries because I believe that the business principles, the marketing principles, the sales principles of every business is the same, right? And, but most people just don't look at real estate investing as a business. They specifically short-term rentals. They think it's vacation rentals. They think it's, you know, uh, it's just a, a secondary investment. I can tell you the biggest investment I ever made into a business was the first short-term rental that I purchased. I'd done 21, 22 startups at that time. And I had to write a $126,000 check to close on my first beach house uh, by myself. And that was, a tr it's a tremendous amount of money today, but it was exorbitant for me at the time. And I probably made the mistake at that time that most, uh, you know, do as well as they spent too much money uh, out of pocket. And I didn't have enough reserves behind that when I got in. That's more important right now, folks, than it's ever been as those, especially those of you that got in in 2020 to date, you've only seen the market like this. It's going like this now and it's, it's leveling out. It's coming back to where, you know, we need to have reserves, especially if it, it what, what happens if we go down another 20% in rents that's between right. now and, and January 1st of, of 2024. And I do believe that's going to happen. You know, so if you're have a net profit of $1,700 right now and you lose another 20% on $60,000 in revenue, you're at about break even to where you're going down below that Mendoza line once in a while. So I, I kind of look at it this way. Can you afford to lose $500 a month? Can you afford to lose $1,500 a month? If you can't, then you shouldn't be investing today. Yeah. So for me, mo people don't know those things when they get into real estate. They don't understand the cycles. They don't know what happened in 2009, 10, and 11 uh, when we had the last major downturn. COVID was an aberration for a short period of time in this industry. And it really affected arbitrage quickly, didn't affect, you know, buying that much. So for me, that kind of goes back to growing up without a father, with a mother, family and education and going, getting introduced to this individual sport to self-educate. I didn't have a coach for five years, four years uh, after I started playing because we couldn't afford golf lessons. Mm -hmm. So I had to teach myself and I had those old guys guzzling, you know, Coors Lights out there on the seventh hole that would say, Hey, Bill, you should do this, you know, just, and they didn't know how to teach, but they were just helping me grow. So I sought out that education. So now for me, it's how do I educate people to not make the mistakes? Cause I have people to come into my programs all the time, Mark. And it's like, Hey, I've got the, and it's happening right now. I've got this property. It's my first one. I'm 60 years old. I'm losing $2,000 a month. Okay. Well, how bad it, how bad is it really? How much do you have in your 401k? Oh, you're retired. Your wife still works. What is the salary for your wife? What's your fam? What's your home? What's your family and home budget? It's identifying all these things. It's what I calling about knowing and being known. 
because I think there is one thing that happens that's super reckless amongst us as coaches. And it's that we give advice when we don't know what's behind the curtains for the people that we're talking to. One thing I've noticed about you, Bill, like I've seen you on stage, I've seen you speak to a lot of people and I've seen you in intimate, well, I've seen you in a couple intimate moments. I don't pretend to know you super well, but I've seen you in a couple intimate moments where you reassure people or you just tell them, hey, maybe you should point to a different path. But I've, I've heard it said that the sweetest words a male can ever hear from their father is, I'm proud of you. And some guys go there. So for females, it's probably, I love you. But for males, it's from their dad. And some guys go their whole life and never hear that. And some guys go until they're 80 or they're 50 and they hear from their 80-year-old father, I'm proud of you, and they break down crying. One thing I've observed from you, and and I don't know if if this is kind of an unsaid thing, but how you, I mean, you're very uh, stern with people, but at the same time, you you lend words from a coaching standpoint, like, I'm proud of you. Like, this is exactly what we talked about. You did it. Way to go. So I, the, the only reason I bring that up is, um, and I don't know where that comes from, that kind of innate um, empathy. I didn't get I it. Have. What's that? I didn't get it. That's why I think that's where it comes from. Yeah. And when, when I quit playing professional golf, I, sent, I, I just met my wife and we opened up our first restaurant and I became the college golf coach at Cal State Bakersfield University, making a whopping five grand a year in salary. And <laughs> wow. it was a passion thing for me. I wanted to, mm -hmm. I, I loved teaching. I wanted to do that. But and the reason I bring this up is it's going to answer your questions. My kids that played for me hated my guts. Mm -hmm. I was the Bobby Knight of golf coaches. I was making them run without any preparation, going to work out with a wrestling team, which was Pac-10, D1 at that time. Mm -hmm. And like, hey, we're going to go run five miles. We've never ran before. I don't give a shit. You're running and keep up. And if you finish last, you know, you're not playing in the next tournament. Just hardcore stuff because that's the way that I was – you know, taught as well. Yeah. Um, and my kids, half of them hated my guts. A couple of them respected me. Every one of them loved me today because I was hard, but you're right. I did tell them I was proud of them when they, yeah. when they, not even when they were successful, but just when they put in the effort that yeah. I really commanded and demanded from them. And it's the same. I think it, I, it's somewhat intentional, but I think a lot of it is subliminal that happens from me not getting that as a kid. I didn't, I got to share my successes with my mother, but I think I always had this yearning desire, Mark, to be honest with you, to have my father there, you know, to not that I wanted him because he walked out on me and my mother and I always had this angst towards him, but I wanted to prove to him how good I was. You know what I mean? Cause I, I didn't, he didn't get to see that. And thank God my grandfather got to see me, you know, excel at least through all the, all the national championships I won in high school. And then I went to UCLA and he got to see me win a couple of tournaments there. And he, I played professionally for five and a half years and he got to experience what I did for the first two before he passed away. Uh, but he never got, I never escalated to the very, very top. I got super close. Because when you're retired at my age, I've been retired professionally for a long time, but even I haven't even played golf for six and a half years, you know, you don't make it to that pinnacle level. Um, so I think a lot of that is just probably the yearning desire that I never got to hear those words from my father. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that, I mean, you're, you're obviously a great coach and that's a lot of what you do in this industry is you educate and you coach people when you help people get to be where they want to be. And then obviously like you, like you've already done in this podcast, you kind of warn them about roadblocks ahead of them. Dave Ramsey always says you have, you have the heart of a teacher. Like there's, there's one kind of coach who's like, Hey, I'm only going to teach you these four things. And it's very rote. Like everything's the same for every person. And then there's another kind of coach that really, understands who you are, what your goals are, and warns you about the roadblocks and warns you about, you know, the gold medals and the German shepherds is what I like to say. You know, some <laughs> some some of it's kind of an insurance thing and some of it's kind of like, hey, this is this is the gold kind of thing. And so I just want to 
commend you and let our audience know, like, uh, just what I've observed from afar um, in you as a coach. I really appreciate that. I think that as I, I guess I kind of became, I mean, I became a coach when I started coaching collegiate golfers, but in, you know, business and kind of adult coaching, I was very cognizant. I mean, I, I, I had access, I, I bought access to some of the best coaches in the world mm. um, and kind of bought my way in to be able to learn. But one of the things that, that I saw from a non-paid coach who I got to honor this year at the SDR Wealth Conference, John Bairden, um, was he didn't have a system. He didn't have a formula. And he's the one that kind of introduced me to the term of knowing and being known and why that's important when you're a coach. And specifically when you're talking about large sums of money, for most people when they're doing what we do is investing today, it's the most money like it was for me when I started of you know, anything that we ever do, whether it's buying a primary residence, whether it's starting a business, um, you know, I, gosh, I've $470,000 check I, I've written for, you know, the largest property that I've, I've ever piece of real estate I've ever purchased. That's an insane amount of money. I couldn't wrap my head around, you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but for me, it's not a system. It's not a formula. It's there's principles to follow. There's you know, iterations and stages that we need to follow. And there's a process that we need to follow, but it's different for everybody based on their desired outcome, where they're at in life, where they're at financially and where they're at mindset wise. And if they're married, then you throw in the whole next component of your spouse. Cause yeah. most people that I come in contact with in this space, the spouse and, and the spouses are not unified. They think they are, <laughs> but they're not. And yeah. so that's kind of been one of my big missions, Mark, is to make sure that they, the spouses are aligned with their goals personally, professionally, financially, because it makes it so much easier. And yeah. I've had, I've been married for 25 years, never had to sleep on the couch, never left to go stay at a hotel. I mean, my wife and I've had our arguments, but thank God we've never had these, you know, huge issues. And, but what I, and we, our marriage has been amazing, but what I found out when John Bairden put me through this life planning exercise is we were not aligned because I was like many other alpha males that I didn't realize my oldest daughter, 17, I didn't realize until she was seven that my wife and I hadn't been on a vacation for five years, Oh man, five man. years. I just, I didn't. I I'd done four startups during that time. I'm in grind mode. I'm trying to provide, I'm trying to fill up 529 plans. I'm trying to yeah. fill up SEPs. I'm trying to do all these things to benefit find it, my family financially when all my wife wanted was for me to be home, man. That's it. And, and be present, not have this thing, you know, going off. And that's my favorite photo ever. That's my youngest daughter giving me just one of the greatest hugs before we went to the father daughter dance. And if I would have stayed on that path and that's a reminder for me that if I would have just kept focusing on business, I probably would have missed that father daughter dance. And then what inherently what happens, Mark, it's a different level, but I'm turning into my father. My father walked out on me and my mother in, on, on his own accord intentionally. Absent. I sure as hell didn't want to do it unintentionally. Yeah. And that's yeah. when everything changed. Well, man, Thanks for sharing that. I know that's uh, that's intimate to you. So thanks for sharing that. I just actually sent my two daughters away for camp for two weeks. And then my wife and I would go away. And um, that picture you just showed, like all I wanted was like a deep hug. <laughs> that's really all like I, you know, you can say I love you in so many ways, but how I love it from from my little girls, because I'm a girl dad, is is just a deep hug, and you don't even have to say anything. So, I I really love that picture. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, from a from a short term rental standpoint, so you've gone through a lot of startups. How did you land in this space? Like, what what happened to bring you into the short term rental industry? It's where I'm going on Thursday. <laughs> Actually, my, uh, my wife and we were on a family vacation down at, at 30A, um, down oh, in, in, in Seagrove and Seaside. And one of my really dear friends that I used to, I met him traveling and playing professional golf down on the South American PGA tour in 1993. 
Um, he owned a huge resort in Destin and at the millennium, uh, shut it down, demolished everything and built about $800 million worth of homes on his, on his property. And then he became, he's probably the largest individual owner of short term rentals in the panhandle. Uh, he manages over 600. Um, and we were having, if anybody's been down to Seaside or the 30A, we're having, or the pizza place there. And literally we're talking to him and said, Hey, Bria, we, we love it here. We'd love to buy a house here. And we didn't have any money. And he's like, how much cash do you have? You know, what's your budget? I'm like, we don't know. I said, Bria, my wife just wants to see the water, hear it and smell it. Those are the only three criteria that we have. Okay, well, what's your budget? I said, I don't know. I've got 125000 bucks. So what year is this? Give me some perspective. 2015. Okay. Way before COVID. 125000 bucks <laughs> still didn't go very far down in Seaside. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, six. He called me six-pack. I called him wee-wee. He's all, what you're asking for, you can't afford here. And he's all, you can't afford it in Miramar. He's all, you might be able to go to the east side of Panama City Beach. Eight years ago, couldn't afford it. And he said, go check out. He's like, have you ever been to Gulf Shores or Orange Beach? I'd never even heard of it before. And he's like, go check it out. So I got on Zillow, whatever. Well, I don't even remember. Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, whatever. Found some houses. Found a house that I liked. Found a real estate agent. Said, hey, my wife and I are going to fly down just for one day. We're not staying the night. We're flying to Pensacola. We'll drive over. I want to see as many houses as, as we can in this time frame. Um, we ended up staying the night. We saw, I think, 10 or 11 houses in the first day. And the very first one that I'd picked out for the agent, and the agent was the listing agent, we ended up purchasing. And so prior to that, my partner in Glow Golf, we had had a, a condo in Destin. He bought a house in Estes Park, Colorado without me knowing. Uh, so we were partnered in that and treated it differently. We kind of rented it out, but that was really my first by myself foray. It was really a lifestyle asset that we could use, but we wanted it to pay for itself because we weren't independently wealthy at that time to be able to afford, you know, a loss. Long story short, I bought it. It was unique. It's everything that I do today. And for some innate reason, I have an ability to identify unique properties um, and then turn them into what I call super properties and super portfolio. Long story short, I did what everybody, most people do when they first got in before all the educators and the influencers came in during COVID into this space. <clears throat> um, and I hired the, the property management company that was, you know, tied to the real estate um, uh, agent that I bought from. And I'm about three months in, we bought in May and three months in and the summer had gone by and I, I was only like 50% of the way booked during the summer and they're charging $2,500 a week. Um, which I thought I did a little bit of research on my own. And I didn't know, I didn't know about air DNA or SDR inside any of this stuff. And I said, look, what are you guys doing for marketing? Because I should have been sold out through the summer. Every, I mean, every house was sold out. I started looking at their calendars. Oh, well, you know, we do social media and blah, blah, just all the, you know, the rhetoric standard stock answers. And they didn't know I owned a $10 million marketing agency at that time. And I didn't see any Facebook mm -hmm. ads. My property didn't have a direct booking website. There was no social media going on. Um, I signed up for their email list. I never got any emails from them. So finally, after quizzing them about all this type of stuff, um, I just said, you know, F it. I'm going to fire you guys. Well, you have to use this for the next year. I said, I don't give a shit what your contract says. You can sue me. I'm firing you. You're, I'm changing the locks. It was a bad breakup. And that's where my animosity came towards property management companies because I interviewed probably 15. I was going to switch to another PM. I ended up taking it on on my own. And then I kept looking at all the other PMs over the years, and it was all the same stuff. They're there to manage the property. Nobody ever gave me any insight as to what I should do to make more money or make it more hospitable or any of that type mm -hmm. of stuff. They just put their resort lock on and, and move forward. And there's, you know, more modern, I don't know, there's a different, I, there's this disdain, as you probably know, Mark, between old school property managers and the new co hosts. That's right. So I'm That's just going to call it, you know, property managers. There's old schoolers that do it the same way, and they're going to get, they are getting disrupted by co hosts. They're doing it you know, differently and better. That's right. The biggest thing I didn't like was the lack of transparency that they own the Verbo listing that they owned all that type of stuff. So I, that's when I started doing it on my own. And I have a case study when I started becoming a coach it was the first thing I did is they did 42, $43,000 in the first year. Um, 
before I bought the property, they were, I let them run it two, three months, whatever. I can't remember exactly what it was. I did like 98,000 in the next 12 months. Year after that, I did 112,000. Um, and this is well before COVID. We're talking, you know, 15, 16, 17, yeah. uh, that that was happening. Um, well, then I started doing what I do all the time. I started leveling up. I took the money that I was able to save because we didn't have to live on the profits uh, that we made. And I bought another property. Well, I lost, ident I mean, ironically, $126,000 on that second property. I used an inexperienced agent. I didn't put my eyes on it before I closed on it. Mm. Um, I do what gets me in trouble a lot. I help somebody that didn't want help and mm. he took advantage. And long story short, um, you know, weather, all these things happened. And I ended up selling, uh, you know, a two bedroom that we tried to convert into a three bedroom that the contractor got red tagged by the county. Um, he didn't rough it in, dry it in appropriately, had major storms come through, basically I had to sell the land and took $126,000 hit on property number two. And what most people don't understand is property number two is the hardest. I just taken all my savings, my profit from property number one and rolled it into property number two. Property number two was much smaller than what I had purchased in property number one, but I wanted to start leveling up. It really sucked. Yeah, I didn't invest into another property for two years after that. I had to rebuild my coffers, rebuild my profits, take my savings, rebuild it. And my wife wasn't comfortable doing it. She didn't think I knew what I was doing. And she was right. I didn't. So at this point, you were still, this is what, 2016 to 2018. Mm -hmm. You were still running Glow Golf at that point? Um, we still had Glow Golf. So I had, uh, I exited out of my ground transportation company. I had gotcha. my marketing agency was my big business at that time. Got that up to about 11 million uh, as a marketing agency. And so what I did is I started, I, I applied my marketing skills to that one property. And that's how I was able to elevate from that 42, $43,000 a year to 98 and then to 112. Um, in 2018, um, I ended up selling that property. And excuse me, I sold that in 2019. And that's when I started to scale right before COVID. Uh, the pricing yeah. had already gone up. I paid 624. I sold it for 895. I rolled that into buying a lot, which I built my number one property that I have today. Um, and Dragonfly had to go through a bunch of legal stuff. It took forever uh, because yeah. the LLC that there's multiple members in an LLC, one had evaded the country. But I, I didn't want to lose that lot because it was one of the last remaining tier two lots in Gulf Shores in a place called West Beach, the primary that still had open lots in front of it. Yeah. Um, and my attorney that I had to hire grew up there, knew the owners of the, of the lot, found out for me that those lots were in trusts for miners. So I knew I had a really good runway before those things could be built on. Mm -hmm. One of the huge you know, kind of tenants for me is doing as deep of research as you can before you invest into a market, a sub market and a property. And after I'd started construction or bought the lot, even before we started construction is when I found out about the airport, you know, in Gulf Shores that it was, you know, switching from, um, you know, being a private airport to a public airport with commercial flights. So that's when I started diverting properties over from the Fort Morgan area out into uh, West Beach, but that's kind of how I got started. And I had to sell that first big property that I had on my own. My partner and I had also sold a Destin condo as well. Uh, so it created cash. And one of the things where I think I'm a little bit different is I, I try to build super properties that create a super amount of cash flow and mm -hmm. cash on cash return. So I can have a lot less properties than the average owner because I don't want to invest that amount of time. So I'd rather have like my number number one producing probably Dragonfly in 2022 did $357,000 in revenue. I'm all in new construction, pool, bikes, you know, incredible design elements, everything for 997,000 bucks, oh, sub million wow. dollars. But it was about the proximity, the location, you know, the marketing, all these things that kind of stack, you know, to create this super property. And so then I'd leverage the cash from that property you know, I think year number one, I netted pretty close to 200 grand off that property. Um, I mean, I paid cash for the lot, uh, which was 300,000 bucks. My, uh, my loan was 600,000 roughly at, uh, you know, 
3.75%, I think. I mean, yeah. and that's 20 year loan, commercial loan. I don't even know what my note is on that 3,300 bucks, 3,200 bucks. It's nothing. You go buy a million dollar property today. You're looking at six, $7,000 a month. For sure. So that is kind of how then I, I continued to buy and level up. So one thing I did in 2021, just in Gulf Shores, I've never been a flipper, but I flipped nine properties. Oh, made wow. almost $3 million flipping nine properties with almost zero, almost zero construction. The market was appreciating so fast that I held the average property 90 days. It would take us about two weeks post-close to get it up and running. We would rent it through the spring and the summer, make 50, 60, sometimes 100 grand per property, then sell at the back end of the summer. Wow. And then we would, some of the properties, a portion, usually about 30%. We would 1031 to tax defer, roll that into another property, take the cash on the other side. There's a few things you said there I want to just chat about for <laughs> a second. One of them is location. You talked about this lot in Gulf Shores. Like we've invested a lot in, in the Smoky Mountains and we have quite a few properties up there. But the difference between the beach and the mountains is there's only one first row. There's only one second row. There's a lot of mountain property out there with views. Mm -hmm. And so when you're creating this ideal, and there's only a handful of properties that are close to town, and there's only a handful of properties that have the river, but there's a lot of mountain property in a mountain area. Um, so that's, that's one big differentiation that I kind of understand from what you said about the location of the lot that you, that you chose. And, and that all goes into creating these super properties, right? Like location is just one of them. And then amenities is another one. Would we talk about, talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's lo location, proximity and view. So, I mean, those are the two most important tenants wherever you're at. Um, I've got a, my biggest properties in Banner Elk, North Carolina in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's got, it's at the very top of the mountain, extremely long range views. It's probably in today's market, a $300,000 stack stone rock steps and fire pit. Um, it's sleep wow. 16. It's got a guest house. It's on two acres. It's got a lake at the bottom of the, the subdivision. It's super five minutes to downtown Banner Elk. It's right in between uh, Sugar Mountain and Beach Mountain. Yeah. It's, and it's a great house. It's got a hot, it's got everything. All I did was really update the furnishings and take a three car garage and put 22 grand into that to turn that into a movie theater and game room. Yeah. That's about it. And I was able to create a super property because I found the best property in the best location at the top of the mountain, right? And I paid dearly for them, but the biggest investment I've ever made in my life, $1.6 million. Um, but I strategically 1031 into that property, 420 grand down, right? And, you know, so, and that was 1.2 million, similar like to the beach house, like 4% yeah. interest, maybe slightly less. Uh, did that over a 30 year AM um, to keep my expenses down so I can maximize my cash flow. Uh, we did, I don't remember the exact number, it was just under 300, 285, 295,000 bucks. But one of the reasons I went to Banner Elk is it was an untapped market. I found a hole in the market for properties of that size. Mm -hmm. What I just described to you is average in Gatlinburg and Sevierville. <laughs> That's why nobody should fucking invest there, right? right. I can and take that same thing and plop that down into Banner Elk. And, and this is where the sub markets become absolutely critical. It is different in Banner Elk than it is in Seven Devils or that it is at Grandfather Mountain or Beach Mountain or Sugar Mountain or Newland. It's different in Sevierville. It's different in, you know, Wayne's Valley. It's different in Pigeon Forge. And people don't understand that. Those sub markets are absolutely critical. And then that's going from market to sub market. And then it's the property itself. So that same property, if I, that same street at the top of the mountain, if I come halfway down my street and I plop that same house there, it's probably does 30 to 40% less, maybe 50% less in revenue. I don't have the views. I don't have the lots. I don't have all that stuff. 
Yeah. So that's where the number one mistake, but also the number one advantage for me is buying the right property. You said river. You've probably seen my, if you follow me, my house in Montana, that's the prime example. Yeah. It's not in whitefish. It's 15 minutes outside. Whitefish is the market. It's 15 minutes outside of Whitefish and Olney. Nobody's ever heard of Olney unless they've been there. The cabin, nobody's seen the front of it. You know why? Because nobody ever will until they actually get there. It's just a brown wall with a door. That's all. It's ugly. It's horrible. But man, when you get on the other side of that cabin and you stand like I did looking out those windows, I forgot to go upstairs. If you know that story, <clears throat> when me and my wife were looking at it and the river and the views are so majestic. And it's so close. We're 30 feet from the back deck to that river. I didn't buy a cabin. I bought a river. Yeah. I bought oh, a yeah. view. Oh, yeah. And then I, how do you turn that into a super property? You market the shit out of that river. The paddle boarding, the fishing, the views of the Canadian Rockies, that there's a, a beaver made dam that, you know, is 100 years old stopping up the, the river. Um, that you can see the Canadian Rockies all the way into Canada from that back deck. And then you go and you add and put in $24,000 to add a $12,000 hot tub, you know, a $6,000 barrel sauna, and have that same view right down the river. And then you put glasses of wine on the edge of the hot tub and you put people in the hot tub and, and of shooting behind them with the view. Mm -hmm. So it all ties in to where it's not just the thing. It's not just adding a hot tub. That doesn't make you an extra 50 grand. Adding a $12,000 hot tub makes you another 15. Putting it in the right spot with the right view, with the right staging, with the right photos at the right time of day, and then putting yeah. that on to TikTok, putting that on to Instagram, putting that into my first image, putting that into email marketing. That's how you turn that $15,000 return into 50. Bill, you make an incredible point. You make an incredible point. We built a co-hosting slash property management company on the back of our property, the Smokies. And recent statistics up there say there's 17,000 short-term rental properties. So imagine like everybody over the past two years built four and five bedroom pool cabins because pool cabins became mm -hmm. the big thing. They're all brand new. So to stand out, you really, really got to do something really rare. And you really got to focus on the pictures. You got to focus on the design. You got to focus on the garage door. You got to focus on all these things that you're talking about. But the point I wanted to make is you're talking about these sub markets. Like, yeah, in a, in a territory that has 17,000 places, there's going to be a lot of great, a lot of great competition. But in Olney, which is close to Glacier National Park near Whitefish, Montana, there's not as many. And so to stand out, like this is maybe a tip for the audience, but to stand out, it's easier to stand out. Is is that fair? 100%. So, I mean, I went to, remember, I'm sitting in 38 Pizza with my friend Wee Wee, mm -hmm. who's the expert in Dustin. He says, Bill, don't buy here. Go to Gulf Shores. Yes. When I went into Fort Morgan, Alabama, essentially Gulf Shores, nobody had golf carts, nobody had paddle boards, nobody had kayaks, nobody had coffee bars, nobody had any of that stuff. I, I learn and I take and I created the coffee bar. I hate coffee. I added a golf cart because I saw people in 30A had golf carts. I was in a, a, a community that you could use a golf cart to get to the community pools, to get to the tennis courts before pickleball, before they turned mm -hmm. into pickleball courts. <laughs> I added kayaks. I added stand-up paddle boards. I created a coffee bar because I had a friend of mine, you know, diss me on, you know, my, my Folgers and my 10 cup pot that was sitting yeah. there. Okay. Educate me because I don't, okay. You need to have a frother. You need to have, you know, espresso, blah, 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 all this stuff. I have all that in every property now. So the hosting level in Gulf Shores back then was like three levels below Seaside. It was, so you, you had like Seaside 30A and then Dustin yeah. would be down here. Right. And then the farther east you would go, just then Fort Walton, then Pensacola <laughs> or Navarre, Pensacola. Then you hit Orange Beach. Now you're in, and it just kept getting lower and lower and lower. You get to Mississippi and it's just like, there's your mobile home. I'm just kidding. And you go out and rent it. The, I've invested in I Mississippi. love those markets. That's why I went to North Carolina versus going into the Smokies. Yeah. It's why I went to Whitefish versus going to Big Sky, yeah. you know, Montana. 
It's why I'm in Cave Creek, Arizona, as opposed to Scottsdale, Arizona. The secondary markets, pay attention, folks, is where you make money. Nobody's making money investing into the Smokies today unless you're getting something off market that somebody is fire sailing today. I promise you, you're going to lose your ass if you go into Gulf Shores or Destin or the Smokies or Broken Bow and you're paying standard rates right now. Just had this conversation with Avery on our super team who has an incredible off-market deal right now for our war room. And how you, it's, it's, it's the old adage is true. You make your money on the entry and you make your money on the exit. Now you still have to do things to make money in between. And my, I don't know if you came to my very first conference um, in June, a year and a half ago, I guess it's two years ago of the STR wealth conference. And the adage was 30% cash on cash. Why settle for less? Oh, in I mean, June, in March of this year, it's completely different. Yeah. It's very challenging to find 30% cash on cash. I have been, I mean, it's no secret if people follow me. I mean, three, it's been three years. It took me two and a half years to find my place in Montana. Um, I've been looking for a place in, in Florida since I got into this in 2015. And I finally found that diamond in the rough, a sub million dollar property on 30A, really one house off of 30A, 300 yards to beach access. Oh, wow. For under a million bucks. But I've been patient. I've been doing ridiculous amount of Zillow time, my wife calls it. Yeah, (laughs) Bill's not married to me. He's married to Zillow. And she jokes about that because I spend more time on Zillow than any, any other website. I can relate. But those, the patience pays off. There's no question. Yeah. So where are you at now? How many, how many properties are you at? What kind of revenue are you, are you aiming at? And are you looking to, are you, are you still increasing revenue year over year, 2022? I I optimize. Yeah. I have one property too many right now. I have 11. Okay. And I'm getting ready to add on, which will be 12. So I sold one uh, beach mountain property to get out of that market because it was my uh, lowest producing cash flow property. So I was at, and I just did a, a super house Sunday, something I do on Sundays. And I actually showed everybody. I showed market value, equity, 2022, uh, you know, gross revenue, net income, and year to date, 2023. So for me, it's really staying around that 10 mark, but it's it used to be to get to $800,000 in net income. Don't care about the gross revenue. Yep. Um, well, I surpassed that and I was at 997 um, which is I'm trying to get over that million dollar mark now and then just stay there and stabilize and optimize. Um, I could do more, but some of the properties, well, in that Montana hasn't done a dime yet. So there's no revenue there because I'm still waiting on septic, which is still another four months away. Knew that going in just FYI. Uh, so I budgeted a year of a loss, about a $70,000 loss on my carry costs when I bought the Montana property. Um, so I'm trying to get to that million dollar mark in cash flow. And then I'll, I'll just, I'm going to stay, stay there. I don't need more properties. I just continue to optimize. When you say almost a million dollars in net income, that, that includes all your operational expenses, mortgage, everything. Net income. Yes. Yeah. Net, net. Yes. Yeah. And that does not include my co-hosted properties. That's just the owned properties. I also have 12 that I co-host currently. Yeah. And um, you've taught me quite a few things um, just about hospitality, which brings me to a to another thing. A, a lot of folks kind of get in this industry and they have like big jobs. You know, they have 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Some of them are doctors, lawyers, things like that. And um, they, they short-term rentals might make sense. Like it, it probably does make sense from a, from a uh, pure investment standpoint. But sometimes like, like you, you have a heart of a coach, but if you don't have like hospitality kind of in your veins and you're easily irritated, maybe you should find somebody else to co-host. Am I, am I right about this? I I get easy. I get irritated easily. There's no question. I mean, I think anybody that has a quadruple type A personality and some ADD does, um, 
I, I don't know how to answer that question. What I will say is it is not a passive industry. Even though the yeah. income is classified by the tax code as being passive, if you want to excel, if you want to build, you know, we, I use the term super property, but I built a super portfolio that supports a super life, right? It is, it takes hard work. I mean, I'm probably one of the few guys though, Mark, that at least in what I do, a coach, an influencer, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call us, um, that's actually in it. Almost everybody has VAs or they have employees or whatever. I don't. I am, I live and breathe in my business. And for me, as a coach, that's really important because if I can't run those five miles I made my you know, kids run as a coach, then I shouldn't be making them run it. I did run with them. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm the one that does my pricing optimization. I'm the one that communicates with my guests. I'm the one that does the welcome video to every booking that comes in. Um, I don't have three VAs or 10 VAs that run my portfolio for me. I've figured out technology. I've figured out, um, you know, how to automate and how to scale, no question. Uh, but for me, it's extremely personal. This is my family business. Even for the properties that I co-host, I treat them just like mine. I refer to my refer to them as, as family owned because they are. Mm -hmm. I refer to my daughters, I refer to my wife. Every picture and the per that personalization is, it's all part of the marketing, right? And the hospitality. So when I refer to my lake property as our family lake home, when I refer to a beach property that I co-host as our family beach house, I believe there's this reciprocity from the booker if they have in, and just an inkling of respect <clears throat> that, oh my gosh, this isn't Vacasa or some, some big company. This is their family home. They're going to take better care of it. I don't have any major issues. I've ne knock on wood. I've never had a major party. I've never had anything like that. Yeah. A lot of that's because of the asset class the, the, where I'm at you know, getting into higher value properties. But I think a lot of it's because of the personal connections that I make with my guests that start right from, hey, Mark, my name's Bill. Thanks for booking Dragonfly with us. Hopefully you guys are getting ready for your vacation. Gulf Shores, the water is beautiful. I was just there a couple of days ago. I'm a host along with my wife. We're here to be your personal concierge. If you need anything between now and the time that you arrive, please don't hesitate to text, call, or message me through Airbnb, Verbo, whatever app you booked on. Look forward to serving you. Just something like that. I stole seconds. that idea, by the way. You, it's, you told me that. It's gold. Time. It's great. It's it's gold. Nobody does Nobody it. Nobody does that. That's right. And if you get it in a text, like, that's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank but you. But that's just the starting right. point. So sustain that personal level, you know, all the way through the transition, which is your last two points of contact before they mm -hmm. check out. And then the first two after they check out. And then make sure you stay in communication with them afterwards. And that's how you're going to bring them back. You know, because right now it's really challenging to bring people back to stay with us. Why? Because there's too many options and people are looking for new experiences. The old school fa Brady Bunch family going to the same place for vacation every year is really only existing in the Northeast today. So we got to work double hard, make those personal connections. It's more than just hospitality to convert them, to bring them back for increased direct bookings. Well, the good thing about you is you have several properties in several locations, so they, they they possibly could go to a new experience in a new location. That's yeah. all part of that transition and kind of going through that indoctrination story with them after they stay at property A and introducing them to B through you know mm -hmm. F or however many you have, even if it's one, you know, and if it's if it's one at the beach, and your your second one's at the beach, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. But that, that there's a reason that I've diversified multiple reasons actually into different markets mm -hmm. um, around the country. That is one of them. That's great, man. Bill, we are running up on our time. This has been awesome for me personally, and I think awesome for our audience. If anybody wants to get in touch with you to find out more about coaching, uh, your co-hosting services or anything else, what is the best way to reach out to you? Um, I mean, buildstrwealth.com is our website. Uh, bill at billfaith.com is my email. Um, and then probably the easiest way is just Instagram, billfaith73. That's F-A-E-T-H, billfaith73 on Instagram. Awesome, man. Thanks a ton, Bill. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Have a wonderful yeah. day, my friend. Yep, you too.